Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. The uh, next item this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the portfolio is transport, net zero, and just transition. Uh, I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question or enter the letters RTS in the chat function if online. And I call question number one, Coca Stewart. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with local authorities regarding promoting the use of public transport services throughout the festive season. Minister Fiona Hislop. The Scottish Government and officials at Transport Scotland engage with local authorities and regional transport partnerships regularly to promote the use of public transport throughout the year. I'm pleased that during the festive season, passengers of publicly owned ScotRail are enjoying an extra late night services uh, leading up to Christmas and additional carriages on busy services, as well as an expanded uh, Boxing Day service, which for the first time will cover Fife, Perth and Stirling. The majority of bus services in Scotland are operated on a commercial basis by private companies and as such the promotion of these services is a matter for individual operators to consider. However, we are aware that bus operators run seasonal timetables. I thank the Minister for that answer. The festive season is indeed an extremely busy period for Glasgow City Centre and people flocking from all over to enjoy our local hospitality and retail businesses. Glasgow City Council, Glasgow Bus Alliance, Glasgow Taxi, Nighttime Economy, Strathclyde Partnership for Transport and ScotRail have teamed up to launch the Choose Public Transport campaign. Does the Minister welcome this campaign and agree with me that choosing public transport during this busy period will free up travel routes, avoid congestion and cut down on travel frustration at what can be a very stressful time of year? Minister. I do indeed welcome the Glasgow Choose Public Transport campaign. It's a campaign which shows how collaborative work uh, between all the public transport operators can send a strong message to encourage people in Scotland to switch from the car and onto public transport. And I'm, I'm especially pleased the, to see ScotRail not only join the campaign, but they are also using all their available digital channels, including various social media, to promote public transport during the festive season. Question number two, Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting Aberdeen's journey to net zero through investment in bus infrastructure. Minister. Uh, we are supporting Aberdeen's journey to net zero through investment in bus infrastructure, including from our bus partnership fund with up to £12.2 million awarded to the North East Bus Alliance to date. This has enabled work to begin on the development of the rapid trans transit system and on bus priority measures on key transport corridors and in the key city centre. We have also supported the acquisition of 59 battery electric buses, 25 hydrogen buses and their support infrastructure to operate in the city. Jackie Dunbar. Uh, I thank the Minister for the answer. Aberdeen Rapid Transit is a key transformational project to provide a cross-city route of bus priority measures to provide fast, reliable, accessible transport from my constituency of Aberdeen Donside to the city centre, similar to Edinburgh's tram network. It is a key measure to improve journey times and improve air quality throughout the city. Can the Minister provide an update on any recent engagement which Transport Scotland has undertaken with Aberdeen City Council and Nestrans regarding this infrastructure project? Minister. Uh, as I have just referred to, we are funding the development of the Aberdeen uh, Rapid Trans uh, Transit Strategic Case through Transport Scotland's Bus Partnership Fund. And as such, Transport Scotland maintains regular engagement with the North East Bus Alliance and last met with Aberdeen City Council and Nestrans and officials to discuss the development of their strategic business case in September. A further meeting with officials is scheduled to take place next week. I was really pleased to see firsthand from my October visit to Aberdeen how the bus gates in the city centre are already delivering for the millions of bus passengers that travel through the city every year. During my visit, I met with the leaders of the council and members of the partnership who presented to me the city centre master plan progress since 2015, and this included presenting on the city centre and the South College Street Bus Partnership Fund projects, as well as the Aberdeen Rap uh, Rapid Trans uh, Transport and Ongoing Corridor Studies. And supplementary, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, President Officer, the new bus gates in Aberdeen, sneaked through with an experimental traffic order, have made a complete dog's dinner of Aberdeen city centre, and have been a disaster for businesses with many people now avoiding the city centre altogether. 
So would the Minister agree with me that a huge change like this should be done properly with full consultation, taking businesses and citizens with us? And the local authority should not ruin people's livelihoods simply as part of an experiment. Minister. Well, the member has expressed his own views, but in terms of the process, uh, I think it's quite clear that the process was properly um, carried through in a transparent way. And indeed, traffic orders are precisely the way that local government make changes, as he will know, because I understand he was a former councillor. Early feedback on the operation shows that bus journey times have been reduced by 25% as a direct result of these bus gates in Aberdeen City Centre. In the past 12 weeks, over a million passenger journeys on the bus have been quicker and more reliable. And the two main operators in the city, Stagecoach and First Bus, are reporting passenger number increases by 5% and 10% respectively. That looks like a successful delivery of a plan to improve transport in the city of Aberdeen. Question number three, Graeme Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government, following the first meeting of the Na National Smart Ticketing Advisory Board, what progress has been made towards introducing a national smart ticketing scheme? Minister. The first National uh, Smart Ticketing Advisory Board meeting, which includes a number of transport industry operators, was held on November the 28th. I've charged members to advise me on how Scotland could collaboratively improve smart ticketing consistency, accessibility and integration between modes and regions and identify the best technological standard for schemes in Scotland. They will report in six months outlining how they will do this, uh, building on the many operations currently available and also due shortly. This plan will look to build on the successful collaborative national smart ticketing enhancements to date. For example, universal smart cards are now accepted across all modes and 98% of Scotland's buses now accept contactless payments. Graham Simpson. Can I thank the Minister for that response? The Scottish Government has been talking about having a national smart card for well over a decade, but in Ireland they have had one since 2011. The, tw the Transport for Ireland Leap card, here it is, covers multiple operators, offers capping and smart discount features. They sold their five millionth card over two years ago. So this is doable and we should get on with it. So can I ask the Minister how long she's given the board to complete all their work. I accept there's a, an update in six months, but what's the final deadline for this? Minister. Well, I, I would expect within the next six months to get the operational plan for delivery. I, I would emphasise that rather than a, a national smart ticketing scheme, Scotland currently uses a single smart card platform already so we do have a single smart card, a, a smart card platform already but it hosts regional ticketing schemes across Scotland and it's compatible with 2.5 million smart cards in circulation in Scotland and it can be used for both concession and commercial smart tickets and is available on bus, rail, tram, subway, some ferries and domestic air. However, I do recognise the point he's making about how do we make sure that it can be on a national basis like smart in Independent Ireland. Uh, and supplementary, John Mason. Thank you. As the Minister says, a contactless payment is available on most buses now and smart cards can be used across different operators. Is she optimistic that uh, perhaps bus patronage will increase through this kind of uh, easier ticketing? Minister. Well, these uh, initiatives were introduced before and during the pandemic, so it is actually very difficult to isolate their impact on bus patronage because of um, the ongoing impact of COVID on travel, particularly reduced bus travel. Uh, we meet regularly with uh, bus operators to understand the initiative's performance. Uh, but they are uh, reporting that contactless payments now generally make up a vast majority of sales and some operators only see cash payments to less than 10%. And that has been, uh, the support for that has come from a smart pay grant fund that uh, the Scottish Government introduced to help over 10 million contactless payments uh, be provided since 2018. I think the point about does it encourage people, I think it can and it will. All I'm saying is that it's very difficult to measure because of the difficulty and comparability of data, particularly on buses because of the COVID period. Question number four, not lodged. Question number five, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what conclusions it's drawn following COP28, including what has been learned as a result of the conference. 
Cabinet Secretary Mary McCallum. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, COP28 has now concluded, notably with a £700 million uh, landmark loss and damage fund and a pledge to transition away from fossil fuels in our energy systems in a just, orderly and equitable manner. These are exceptionally hard-fought and historic agreements, and I want to pay tribute to everyone who's campaigned so determinedly for this progress. Um, it was disappointing that there wasn't a stronger uh, resolution committing to uh, a phase-out of all unabated fossil fuels, but we must now all work together to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees in the terms that were agreed. Um, the First Minister and I participated in very many engagements, urging ambition in tackling climate change and meeting with Global South partners, uh, and we will publish a report of our achievements from COP28 in due course. Colin Beatty. Despite noise from Westminster, Scotland has shown itself willing and able to engage positively with the international community regarding the exist existential crises that is climate change. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how the Government intends to ensure that Scotland's voice is heard internationally and that the views of this country on climate and nature are not mistaken for the embarrassing intransigence of the Westminster parties? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Colin Beattie is absolutely right. The, the Scottish Government and Scotland generally is held in very high esteem on the world stage with regards to our climate change plans and our actions, uh, Scotland's renewable abundance and our commitment to climate justice as well as to human rights and international cooperation. And we really can make a significant difference if we consider that £2 million that Scotland pledged at COP26 for loss and damage, helping to break a 30-year impasse on this important funding, that has now reached more than $700 million, which I think demonstrates what small countries can do when they uh, apply uh, themselves. Um, by engaging positively and at an international level, we will continue to ensure that Scotland's voice continues to be heard. And I personally uh, will not only do that, but I will seek to uh, elevate the voices of other people who are too infrequently heard, be that women, uh, young people and people from the Global South. I have uh, three members seeking to ask a supplementary. I intend to take all three. Uh, supplementary, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. At COP28, we saw a declaration by 24 countries, including the United States, the United Kingdom, Sweden, Finland and the Netherlands, to triple nuclear power capacity by 2050. And this was discussed recently in the Parliament. Can I ask the Scottish Government uh, if the Scottish Government has completed any modelling on investing in nuclear as part of a mix of renewables to support other net zero policy aims, including district heat networks? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding Officer, I thank Brian Whittle for his question. He will know the Government's policy is of no support for nuclear under uh, current technologies. We consider that it never presents value for money to uh, bill payers nor to our environment, and instead, our focus domestically, certainly, is on a future energy system which is balanced across storage and unleashing, of course, that exceptional renewables potential which I referred to in my first answer. Supplementary, Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, given the commitment to the just transition that the Cabinet Secretary has rightly made, can she tell us what the Scottish Government will do now to ramp up activity so that we have a just transition for households that are currently living in damp, inefficient homes and we are seeing energy and heat going through the walls and the roofs of those houses. So what will the Scottish Government do in practice to tackle that just transition um, when we've got the climate crisis and the cost of living crisis? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding Officer, I thank Sarah Boyack for that question. I think one of the, the most tangible and practical examples that I can point to is the Heat and Buildings Bill, uh, the consultation on which the Scottish Government has just opened uh, in, in concert with my colleague uh, Patrick Harvey. This will look to regulate both energy efficiency within Scotland's homes, but also uh, energy systems. And we know that energy efficiency, although often overlooked, is one of the most important ways that we support households to lower bills and to have warmer homes. Couple that uh, with changes to the way that we heat our homes uh, in the name of climate change. That bill presents, I think, a very ambitious approach uh, to decarbonising our buildings, but I can assure Sarah Boyack and the Chamber that it and all of our climate measures will be taken hand in hand with our communities. A supplementary, Willie Rennie. Uh, when the Cabinet Secretary was meeting world leaders, did she tell them about her government's home energy scheme, that only 164 heat pumps have been installed in the first seven months of the programme, that it takes an age to get any money any grants out of Home Energy Scotland, 
that many households just give up because it takes so long to get the money out. Did she tell the world leaders that? And did she tell them how she's going to fix it? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, I, I didn't need to narrate what Willie Rennie has to world leaders because more often than not, world leaders are approaching the Scottish Government asking for our advice on how we have managed to lead the way so successfully yeah. on a number of fronts. And I would say that the, whilst in, in a system like the decarbonisation of buildings, which is vast and complicated, there will always be uh, issues to overcome and the Scottish Government will, uh, will always seek to do that, including by supporting Home Energy Scotland to support people on the ground. I would say Willie Rennie's narrative doesn't support what I see in my role that I'm privileged to hold within government, nor in my constituency, where many constituents are approaching me, having taken advantage of Scottish Government schemes to change their heating systems, which I would remind the Chamber consist of support up to £7,500 and more in rural areas. Question number six has been withdrawn. Question number seven, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Transport Scotland in relation to the Shawhead flyover junction in Coatbridge. Minister Fiona Hislop. Uh, I am aware that the member has raised concerns about the performance of the junction with Transport Scotland and that their contractor, Scottish Road Partnership, is reviewing whether potential alterations would assist the movement of vehicles at this junction. I understand that Transport Scotland wrote to the member earlier this year regarding his concerns. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Minister for that response. I'm sure from those conversations that she describes with Transport Scotland, that she will be very aware of the issues with the junction. She might also be aware, as she said, that I've raised these issues in the Chamber. Since improvement works were completed some years ago, the junction has been a scene of a great many road traffic accidents with varying degrees of seriousness. The junction is well known loca locally and many people report avoiding it despite it being a main transport route connecting to the MA and other Lancashire towns. I have had several discussions with Transport Scotland including on-site meetings and minor changes have been made over the years and I am very grateful for their collaboration and their continued um, support with this. But can I ask the Minister what further discussions she can have with Transport Scotland to make improvements at the junction and thereby enhance driver confidence at this site? Minister. Well, I think the member might understand that I do not personally um, have full information about the exact details of the junction and the exact details of the problems that uh, the Scottish Road Partnership, the contractor, is already reviewing. But I will ask for Transport, ask Transport Scotland to liaise with that contractor to give um, an insight to the member as to what the current state of that review of the potential alterations is at. And if that needs a potential site visit with Transport Scotland, the operator and um, the contractor, sorry, and the member, uh, I'm sure that can be arranged. Question number eight, Alec Murray. The presiding officer to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the next steps of implementation of 20 mile an hour speed zones across Scotland following the October meeting of the multi-stakeholder 20 mile an hour task force. Minister Fiona Hislop. The Scottish Government is committed to implementing 20 miles per hour speed limits on those roads where it is appropriate to do so by 2025. The task group agreed to support local authorities to expand 20 miles per hour speed limits where appropriate as the optimum route to implement at their November meeting. And as a result, work is now underway to establish a delivery subgroup with a communication toolkit being finalised to be used at the local level. Alec Riley. Presiding officer, as an MSP it represents Fife, I've found that the traffic engineers within the council are fairly opposed to 20 mile an hour speed limit, even where people have come forward and, and, and made the case. And therefore, my question is, what are we going to do now, between now and 2025? And I noticed that there was one point... Uh, 7 million given to local authorities, sorry, 1.4 million given to local authorities, 107,000 of that went to five. When I asked Fife Council, they say that that was a consultant's report that was sent to Traffic Scotland. How many more millions will we spend between now and then? And will the Cabinet Secretary give guidance to local authorities that where communities are asking for these safety measures to be put in place, they should at least be considered? Minister. Well, the 20 miles per hour uh, speed limit is something that local authorities themselves have said that they want, but this pace and scale and the time that will be taken in each local authority may vary. Can I say that there are already um, uh, 
trailblazers in this area, particularly in the Highlands and the Borders. And in the Highlands experience, which is going to be used for other local authorities to learn from, it is proving successful. And indeed, communities that don't have the 20 miles per hour uh, limit in their uh, local community are, are actually asking for that to, to now be implemented. So if he, like me, uh, trusts local authorities to carry out their duty, there may be some road engineers that might, not, might personally not be in favour. But actually, local authorities will know the appropriate roads to make 20 miles per hour or not. And I think actually listening to their communities, that they will get a resolution and the implementation of something that I think everybody recognises has benefits, particularly those communities that now are experiencing lower speed limits. And Councillor Scott Arthur, Labour uh, Councillor in Edinburgh, was quite clear on the safety measures that this has brought in that have saved the numbers of injuries on roads already in Edinburgh who are way ahead than many other uh, communities in implementing 20 miles per hour speed limits. And supplementary, Mark Ruskell. Yeah, thanks. Um, can I welcome the progress that's been made across Scotland in rolling out 20, um, not just in Fife actually, but in the borders and the highlands, and the fact that all councils now have a very detailed plan for how they're going to implement 20 mile an hour rollout across their areas, getting us closer to that target, ensuring that all appropriate roads are 20 by 2025. Um, but given that the, the government here has not decided to go down the route of uh, changing the, 20 mile, the 30 mile an hour default speed limit to 20, how will the minister ensure that there is that consistency between councils and there's adequate resources to actually get the job done and to ensure that communities that need 20 mile an hour to create safer streets can do that and we can move forward together? Minister. Well, we will uh, watch and, and learn from the Welsh experience, but our experience will be quite different because we are um, working at the uh, position of asking local authorities themselves to identify the appropriate roads to introduce the 20 miles per hour limit on. In terms of consistency, yes, you want consistency, but you also want local authorities to be able to be in control of their own schemes, and, and that's the balance that we have to, to face. And, and we know from what we've heard, there are some local authorities that are well ahead, Edinburgh, High borders um, and you, the member has expressed that the uh, introduction in Fife is progressing as well um, but they will go at different speeds to get to 20 miles per hour and we have to recognise that's the result of giving that choice that option to choice that local authorities will de designate these roads themselves. Thank you Minister that could concludes could, could I just conclude the portfolio questions on uh, transport net zero and just transition Point of order, Douglas Lumsden. President, officer, I just want to remind members of my declaration of interest, which showed I was a councillor at Aberdeen City Council at the start of this parliamentary session. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. I'm sure that's now on the record. There will be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams to change position should they so wish. Thank you. <laughs>